And during the Meiji Restoration then, uh, all the samurai are fired. They have to turn in their swords, trade them for guns, get rid of their robes, and put on Western uniforms, and you have the creation of a Japanese army. The emperor can no longer appear in classical regalia, but he has to appear in the dress of a Western military, uh, military man. And the creation of all these schools and institutions and factories and the industrialization of Japan, all this is tantamount to the West's assimilation of Japanese society. So this uh, process whereby the West has assimilated all the, all the societies on the planet, more or less, um, has led to the creation of a global ecumeny in which there is no longer an exterior. So there are technically really no longer any external proletariat, but there are a lot of internal proletariats within this, some of them native to the West, some of them not. Uh, some of the internal proletariat native to the West are, as I have pointed out, on the intellectual plane, postmodern critical theory, which is uh, based on a breaking down and dismantling of the Western thought structures. There are also phenomena like what happened at Waco, and uh, with people like Ted Kaczynski and Timothy McVeigh, those individuals constitute a Western internal proletariat who are in the society but not of it and have begun to secede from the body social because they no longer agree that the creative minority can lead the society effectively but has instead become a dominant minority that now commands by force. And now you get a lot of discontent and disaffected individuals who reject that idea, and eventually over time, uh, it's clear that I think we're going to see more and more of these kinds of discontented social formations that are both native to the West and are exterior to it, as in the case of the Islamic uh, fundamentalists. Uh, so we're going to see a lot of discontent. Now, one of the other aspects, I think, of Toynbee that, that uh, actually resurfaced in postmodern theory, and I don't think anybody's noticed this, is that Giorgio Agamben's idea of homo sacer constitutes basically the, the recognition of an internal proletariat. Uh, only he doesn't deal with the aggressive aspect of it. He, he sees the internal proletariat as the stateless peoples, refugees, living in concentration camps or not, but living in situations in which they are in states of exception. They're entirely in the passive victim role. Toynbee's concept is larger. It includes not only the victims, but it also includes, uh, obviously, the internal proletariat who are also aggressive, like Sparta and Judas Maccabeus. Uh, but in Agamben's idea, the homo sacer is the man who can be killed with, with impunity. And this refers to the group uh, that more and more of them today find we're getting more and more refugee camps springing up all over the planet. And Agamben says that the refugee camp, uh, the, the camp, constitutes to the biopolitical age what in uh, Foucault the institutions, you know, prisons, hospitals, etc., were to the, so the disciplinary society that Foucault had written about. And uh, so the camp is the new structure that is emerging in the middle of these cities as a kind of state of, as an undecidable of both nature and civis and, and polis. It's, an un it's a Derridian undecidable, these camps are, in which the peoples inside them are now exist in a state of exception in which the rule of law has withdrawn from them. They are no longer protected by the laws and the judicial apparatus of the polosphere or macrosphere, which protects everyone else, and so they can be killed with impunity. The law no, no longer protects them and no longer recognizes them as having a, uh, a political function. They are just bare, naked life stripped down to existence, and anyone can kill them with impunity. There are no consequences because they exist outside the reach of law. Um, so those are individuals in a state of exception, and they are internal proletariats within the globalized ecumeny that the West has created, and we're seeing more and more of them, just like Agamben said. So that's Toynbee's internal proletariat, one aspect of it that's resurfaced uh, in Pomo thought that nobody has noticed, at least nobody that I've encountered. So, um, so the West is assimilating all of these cultures, and we're seeing a lot of discontent. I think we're going to see a lot more discontent uh, as time goes on. But I also think that we are witnessing the process of Toynbee's next phase, which is the creation of a universal state. Now he says, he points out that Napoleon uh, in the West was the first one to try to create a Western uh, universal state, but it was obviously an abortive attempt. It didn't last. Um, and no one else in the West has so far succeeded in uniting all the West politically under uh, uh, the rulership of a single regime. Uh, but it's likely, as Quigley pointed out, that the you know, Americans will be the ones who do this and will accomplish this and in the process will generate its own internal proletariat, as we've seen with McVeigh and uh, Waco, David Koresh, and all those people, will generate its own internal proletariat and will continue to fight its own external proletariat, even though that has to be relativized to the common 
to the new understanding of the term external within the global ecumeny, where the Limes now are in outer space within the satellite belt. Um, it has to be understood in that context now. Um, but uh, the same structures, I think, are reconstituting themselves. And so though Toynbee's ideas are not deterministic, I think we can see that, that history really does repeat itself. It replays the same structures over and over again on a new stage with new peoples, but the, it's the same structures reincarnating themselves. And so um, the last of Toynbee's stages is the heroic age, uh, the interregnum between civilizations in which you've got the victory of the external proletariat, the barbarian war bands that come in, break down the civilization, and uh, their creation is uh, the creation of their epics. You know, we get the Achaeans and the Sea Peoples coming in, flooding over Minoan Crete, flooding over Egypt, and then laying the foundation for Homeric civilization with the writing of the Homeric epos. The Homeric e epics are the epics produced out of that. We've seen the epics in the West produced by the Scandinavians in Iceland writing the Eddas, and uh, in England writing the uh, Beowulf, and on the continent writing the Song of Roland and then later the Arthurian romances, all that comes out of the great Fulker Bandarung uh, in the interregnum, the heroic age, as Toynbee calls it, between these civilizations. And so we get this basic model that civilization goes through these distinct stages in which um, you have a genesis that is the response to the challenge of either a physical or a social environment. Part of the problem, though, I would point out one of the critiques here, uh, when Toynbee talks about the genesis of these original six, uh, five or six societies responding to challenges produced exclusively by difficult physical terrain and he says that there isn't any social problems there I think um, we have to look at Quigley for that where Quigley's first stage is the stage of mixture where he talks about um, the genesis process being the result of different peoples mixing and colliding I think in every case of the genesis of all these civilizations including Egypt including Mesopotamia those phases begin with peoples colliding with each other uh, you have the Sumerians and the Akkadians, and before them, you, we had had the Halafians and the Samarans. The Samarans are the proto-Sumerians in Mesopotamia, colliding with each other, and from out of that came the first phase. So it isn't just a response to a physical environment, it's also a response to simultaneously to certain uh, conflicts between differing ethnicities that are part of the basic architecture of the creation of these initial civilizations. Their attempts to reconcile in probably almost every case, there are attempts to reconcile opposing religious systems and ideologies uh, by unifying them in the idea of a centralized ruler. Uh, same thing with Egypt, uh, where you have Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt as two different kingdoms. They were basically two different societies, as different as, say, were Israel and Judah from each other. And those two kingdoms were unified by the pharaoh Narmer, who came up out of the south, conquered both, and unified them by creating a symbol system uh, based on the two gods of Set and Horus. Set is the god of Upper Egypt and of the deserts, and Horus is the sun god of Lower Egypt, and the two are put together in strife, and uh, the father becomes Osiris, and you get a set of organizing symbols that creates unity to that civilization. It's not just a response, as Toynbee says, to a physical terrain. There's a social and ideological response that's intermixed there. Uh, and you can find this in every one of the civilizations. In Harappan society that precedes the Indian civilization, there's mixture there between a northern uh, Kot Digian culture and a southern Amri Nal culture that, that combines, and you get the first city-states in the Harappan society, 2600 BC, out of an intermixture of differing peoples. And then you get the Harappan societies disintegrating and the Indo-Aryan nomads coming in and conflicting with them, producing that social collision that then gives rise to the Indian civilization there. So in every case, there are these different social groups that, that collide with each other and come into being. So that's the genesis phase, anyway, uh, modified with my criticism there, in which society comes into being. It grows as the, st as the result of new ideas being brought in by a creative elite. I think that's indisputable. I think there, the societies are run by creative elites. They're not run by masses. The creative elites withdraw. They come up with basic ideas, just as Muhammad came up with the basic core idea of Islam. And they create and stimulate the, sim the civilization, monumental works of art come into being, religion comes into being, it organizes the society, harmonizes it, and keeps it held together. Everyone's on the same page as long as it's functioning. When it stops functioning and the creative minority breaks down into a dominant minority, which no longer can command the mimesis 
out of its own charm, but has to command it by force. Then we get into a time of troubles, break down into civil war, the generation of the dominant minority, the internal proletariat, which then secedes from the body social, and over time, more and more discontent and revolt arises, and you get uh, a new, the creation of a universal church out of that, and then the external proletariat, which then attacks and dismantles, eventually, uh, the dominant minority. The external pro proletariat always wins, by the way. That's one of Toynbee's ideas. They always win, although it takes a while. And uh, then you get a whole new society organized out of that, and the whole process starts over again. So I think there is a hidden cyclicity that Toynbee would not admit to, but I, th I think it's very much involved in the architecture of the way he maps all of this out. I think there's definitely a hidden cyclicity involved in all of that. And so uh, those are Toynbee's ideas in a nutshell. I think what's going on now with the Occupy Wall Street protesters moving in, now it's spreading across the country. Uh, we're seeing the formation now of an internal proletariat uh, that has been ongoing for a while, but now it's being brought to a focus. Our own creative minority uh, in U the United States and American society has completely broken down. Nobody believes in it anymore. And it is inspiring more and more internal proletariats who are now breaking off from that body social, and uh, they're, they're going to have to fight it. And it may or may not lead to civil wars, but it will lead to the creation of new ideologies that will eventually, over time, this is not a process of decades, but rather of centuries, create uh, a new society, a new society, and the old society will, will fade away as a chrysalis that will collapse and disintegrate as the new social order emerges out of it. Um, this is going to take a long time. It's not going to be something that's going to happen overnight. Uh, civilization exists on a macro scale uh, temporality, not a micro one. So we can't get impatient with these processes. You just simply have to ride them out and watch them unfold. And that's it.